right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about sickle cell disease, very commonly tested and fairly common in the United States. So definitely something um, that you'll want to have in your back pocket. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications each and every time I put a new video up. All right, so what is sickle cell disease? It is a hereditary autosomal recessive disorder of the hemoglobin protein, specifically of the beta globin gene. So basically what happens is you have a single nucleotide uh, substitution, leads to a missense mutation, and completely screws up the entire beta globin gene. Remember that you have two uh, components and two of each of them, alpha 2 and beta 2. And so if beta gets messed up, it ruins the entire hemoglobin protein. Um, we denote this as hemoglobin S, S for sickle. All right, so what does hemoglobin S, why does it cause problems? Well, it has a high preponderance to sickling, especially in low oxygen uh, conditions. Um, so what happens is you get a polymerization of uh, this abnormal hemoglobin. It deforms the shape of the red blood cell. And as that red blood cell becomes deformed, um, it can cause occlusion of the vessel. So vaso-occlusion is one of the complications, and that can happen in a variety of places, most notably the lungs, but also the abdomen, the penis, the eyes, and so forth. Hemoglobin S also has a shorter lifespan, so because uh, of that, it gets broken down, and that is why it causes a hemolytic anemia. So we've got vaso-occlusion and hemolytic anemia. Now, epidemiology in the United States, 1 in 12 African Americans carry the trait, um, and so just by simple Mendelian genetics, about one in 500 are affected. Now we test for sickle cell disease at birth. So this is typically not something that somebody is going to come in complaining of X, Y, and Z and sickle cell disease is on your differential. That said, you do always have to consider it. But practically in the United States, it is something that we test for. Now, if you do need to test for it, if some, somebody wasn't diagnosed at birth, for instance, um, then the best initial test is a peripheral blood smear. Usually you will see the sickle cells on that. However, the most accurate test is a hemoglobin electrophoresis because that beta globin uh, protein is abnormal, it will show up um, likewise. Uh, complications can manifest as soon as six months of age. Functional asplenia occurs in almost every patient by early childhood, and therefore, because they're functionally asplenic, it's going to be really important for them to get immunizations, particularly against the encapsulated bacteria. The approach to therapy is really just to manage the complications and to prevent, try to prevent the complications primarily by giving hydroxyurea, which increases hemoglobin F, which although it's not ideal because it holds on to oxygen a lot more uh, avidly than hemoglobin A, it is better than having sickle cells uh, clogging up your uh, small vessels. This is what it would look like on peripheral smear. So, I mean, clearly you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that this is uh, sickle cell disease, uh, but you would want to get the hemoglobin electrophoresis to confirm. Now, the crises of sickle cell disease is where the problem comes. Um, so a vaso-occlusive crisis, which is a nonspecific term, is the most common presentation of sickle cell disease, and that includes acute chest syndrome. Basically, what we're talking here with vaso-occlusive crises is exactly what it sounds like, occlusion of the vessels. And depending on where this happens, it can cause a sudden pain. Um, so when you have a patient with sickle cell disease coming in with any kind of sudden pain, what we have to do is pain control, supplemental oxygen, hydration, and we may do transfusion. Um, so very, very important to do all three of these things. All right, and we will come back to that over and over again. Acute chest syndrome is the most common type of life-threatening vaso-occlusive crisis. It can occur uh, due to a fat embolism as well um, for complicated reasons that we're not gonna go into. You can look it up if you want. It presents almost identically to pneumonia. So you get a chest pain, dyspnea, which can be pleuritic in nature, tachypnea, hypoxemia, and they can even have a fever, okay? So fever 
chest pain, dyspnea. Yeah, it sounds just like pneumonia. So what's our first step? Well, if you know the patient has sickle cell disease, then you've got to uh, administer pain control, oxygen, and hydration. Okay, a little bit different than a garden variety pneumonia comes in. No, we're not giving morphine. <laughs> um, so if you've got a patient with sickle cell disease, you have to bear in mind that the immediate management is a little bit different because we are thinking of an acute chest syndrome, not necessarily just pneumonia. So you're going to get the chest x-ray then after your initial management, and that's going to show infiltrates, um, and that will diagnose uh, acute chest syndrome. So you'll observe these patients with analgesics, fluids, and empiric antibiotics. Why? Well, if they have a fever, you don't know if there's an infection. So we're going to do empiric antibiotics, and that's usually with ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Okay. All right. So um, now there is an indication for exchange transfusion if the PO2 is low. Um, so it would be useful to get arterial blood gases in these patients coming in with acute chest syndrome. This is what it looks like. You can see quite different from a pneumonia. All right, so this is the criteria for acute chest syndrome. So they have that pulmonary infiltrate. It can look like pneumonia, but then they need to have one of the following. Pleuritic chest pain, fever greater than 101.3, dyspnea, hypoxia. Okay, it looks so much like pneumonia, but just think of the fact that the patient has a history of sickle cell disease, okay? Now, splenic sequestration crisis is basically where you get... Uh, sequestration of, uh, of blood in the spleen. I mean, I can't really put it much more simply than that. Now, the problem is not that you're, you're pulling blood out into the spleen. The problem is that, uh, well, I guess it is that you're pulling blood out in the spleen. It causes a hypovolemic shock. Uh, but the problem is not that you're running out of red blood cells. The problem is that it causes hypovolemia and shock. So that's the big issue here. So as you can imagine, fluids are gonna be paramount here. So the treatment is fluid resuscitation, emergent transfusion, and splenectomy ultimately will prevent this from happening again. Now, um, that being said, um, it is important to be aware that this is a patient with sickle cell disease history uh, who comes in with sudden hypovolemia uh, and a sudden uh, uh, hypotension. So look for that in the history. Aplastic crisis is, uh, in the context of sickle cell disease, is typically due to a parvo B19 infection or a folate deficiency. All right, so what do we look for in these patients? Patients with a history of sickle cell disease who suddenly have anemic symptoms, okay? Sudden anemia. Now, a lot of sickle cell disease patients are anemic, but these are patients who are fine, and then over the course of 12, 24, 36 hours, they become very, very anemic, okay? So sudden anemic features. Best initial test, CBC, find the anemia. Um, and then at that point, you can give them folate, but... I would get a PCR looking for parvovirus. The treatment here is red blood cell transfusion, obviously to treat the anemia, and you can give IVIG. These are some of the other complications of sickle cell disease. Priapism is a big one just because it happens in so many patients. The treatment here is to aspirate the blood from the corpora cavernosa. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, there are other uh, routes that we can go. Um, osteomyelitis is another one. I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, abdominal infarctions can happen, very vascular. Um, and then cholecystitis, like any hemolytic anemia, you're breaking down hemoglobin, gets turned into bilirubin, you can saturate and cause a gallstone. So here's just a number of complications. I'm not going to go into all of them. These are some sources. Okay, so osteomyelitis and sickle cell disease is a commonly asked question. What is the number one cause? Salmonella, okay? Now, um, the number one cause overall in everyone is Staph aureus, but salmonella is a big cause in sickle cell, and we don't really know why, but some people believe that it's because of, uh, of poor... Um, Poor, uh, well, how should I put this? Um, basically, the gut is not getting enough uh, perfusion, 
And so some of the gut bacteria get into the bloodstream and then can seed the bone. Okay, I'm trying to put that as sim simply as I can. That is the theory. Okay, so you've got a patient with sickle cell disease who's got osteomyelitis. Um, and uh, what do you need to do next? You, you're, you've got a patient, maybe they've got a fever, they've got bone pain, you did an MRI, you found out they've got, uh, they've got uh, osteomyelitis. What do we always need to do? Bone biopsy. It's only through a bone biopsy that we'll know the definitive cause, and we've got to know that, okay? So treat empirically and then get the biopsy. Some clinical pearls. As we mentioned, the best initial step in a patient with sickle cell disease coming in with any kind of pain is fluids, oxygen, pain control. If they have a fever, we need to give antibiotics. And a good uh, combination would be ceftriaxone and azithromycin, but there are other regimens that you can use, particularly with the fluoroquinolones. Then at that point, you need to get labs. Now, that having been said, make sure, especially on CCS, that you're getting blood cultures before you give antibiotics, okay? I included it up here, but just make sure. That's a general rule of thumb for anything. Blood cultures come before antibiotics. It's very easy. I mean, you just get your blood, dry your blood, and then you can give the antibiotics. But don't have antibiotics running and then get blood because you'll ruin your culture. Um, so at minimum, you want to get a CBC, a chest x-ray, your analysis, and then, like I said, blood cultures, and then other things depending on the presentation. Now, when do we do exchange transfusion? By the way, what is exchange transfusion? Basically, what you're doing is you are giving blood and taking blood out at the same time. So you're taking the patient's blood out, which has the sickle cells, and you're giving healthy blood to them. Now, there are a number of ways you can do it. You can do like a jury rigged um, uh, exchange transfusion where you're uh, giving blood and then drawing it out and then giving it and then drawing it out manually. Or there are machines that do this for you. Um, so we always do it with acute chest syndrome for CNS events like stroke or vision loss, uh, priapism if there's no response to drainage, and then multi organ failure. So, really extreme circumstances. Okay, so here's a vignette. 10-year-old boy comes into the ED with his mom complaining of severe abdominal and chest pain over the last hour and a half. It's been worsening. Uh, when asked where it hurts, he points to those places. The mother said that she gave him Tylenol and ibuprofen, but it hasn't helped. Recent history significant for an upper respiratory tract infection. Past medical history significant for sickle cell disease, diagnosed at 11 months. Medications include prophylactic penicillin. Recommended vaccinations are up to date. Um, he is mildly tachycardic, uh, and he's running a temperature, and he's uh, satting below 90. So physical exam, distressed by basal or rails, remainder of exam is normal. What sticks out here? I kind of already underlined these things. So <laughs> I underlined all of them. Okay, so this is a kid who likely has acute chest syndrome. So our initial management, again, supplemental oxygen, uh, saline, and morphine. And then we're going to get our labs... Um, which, you know, it looks like a lot, but we can do these fairly quickly. But as soon as you get the blood for the culture, then you're going to start antibiotics right away. Now, we're getting CBC, BMP for obvious reasons. He's got difficulty breathing, chest pain. We get the chest x-ray. You should always get the ABGs. We're going to get EKG and troponin for the same reason. Sickle cell disease usually spares the heart, but we should cover all of our bases. Because he's also got abdominal pain, we're going to get liver function tests and amylase. Okay, and what do we find? Um, so all this stuff has been started. The morphine improves his pain. Um, so CBC shows a low hemoglobin, as we'd expect, elevated white count. Uh, reticulocytes are appropriately elevated. Um, so you can see the rest of it here, fairly normal. He's got an elevated unconjugated bilirubin, again, something we expect to see. Um, so uh, this looks like acute chest syndrome. So what we're going to do is we're going to admit him to the ICU. We're going to give a broad spectrum antibiotics. We'll continue the oxygen and fluids, morphine as needed. We'll do an exchange transfusion that's indicated for acute chest syndrome. Consult hematology. They're going to take care of most of this. Continue the pulse oximetry and incentive spirometry. This is basically what you would get in CCS. That's pretty much all they're going to test you on. Um, they're not going to go any further than that because this is really the domain of hematology. Long-term management, hydroxyurea is cornerstone. you got to know that for your exam. What does it do? It increases hemoglobin F, which doesn't sickle. 
Um, there are other drugs if hydroxyurea cannot be tolerated. Hydroxyurea can cause myelosuppression, so we have to look out for that. There are a couple other drugs. They're good they, at what they do, but they are also expensive. Folate supplement all these patients. It is a hemolytic anemia. Like with any hemolytic anemia, we supplement with folate. Kids under five get prophylactic penicillin. It's unknown whether this is really effective in adults. So for now, just children under five. Oral pain management, uh, try to keep it as, as minimal as we can. So NSAIDs we'd start out with, and then, you know, if that's not enough, maybe add uh, acetaminophen. Uh, but ultimately, most of these patients are going to need uh, stronger NSAIDs or even opioids. Uh, patient education, just be aware of signs of infection, worsening anemia, pay attention to pain, don't downplay it. Um, and then adhere to the immuniz immunization schedule, really looking at those, uh, those encapsulated uh, bacteria like H. influenza, pneumococcal, and meningococcal infections. Uh, one last thing, patients with sickle cell disease, they cannot take the live uh, influenza vaccine, the nasal uh, vaccine. They need to get the actual uh, intramuscular vaccine. And so this is just a recap here. I'm not going to read through all this, but it's everything that we discussed.